Hi, this is Trevor. Before the podcast starts, I just wanted to let you know that my new book, The Weekly Writing Routine Workbook, is now available on my website as well as Amazon and all the major online retailers. The workbook is a companion to the 12-week year for writers and will help you create a powerful custom writing routine that fits the way you work. Welcome to the Get Your Writing Done podcast. I'm Trevor Thrall, author of the 12-week year for writers and the weekly writing routine workbook. If you enjoyed today's episode, please submit a review wherever you get your podcasts. And for updates on the podcast and other writing resources, you can subscribe to my newsletter at getyourwritingdone.com. Do any of the following scenarios sound familiar? You know you need to do some research for your book, but you have no idea where to start. You want to write a book about a new topic or a novel that takes place in a new setting, maybe? but you're so worried that you won't sound authoritative or convincing enough, you spend months doing research, never sure whether you've done enough. Or you've created a great plan and doing research is in the plan, but when you start doing the research, you can't figure out if it's getting you anywhere. Or maybe you're in the middle of your book, but you run into a topic that you need to know a little bit more about. Weeks later, you realize you've fallen down the rabbit hole of research and haven't started writing again. Or maybe the next thing on your to-do list is to work on that, the most important chapter of your book or thesis, but you keep finding more excuses to do more research. And, or maybe you've had a great idea for a new book and you've been doing research for five years and you still haven't started writing. <laughs> ah, If you've ever found yourself in one of these situations you've fallen into the research trap. Research. Every author does research. Whether you write fiction or nonfiction, I don't think you can really write a book without doing some kind of research. And the funny thing about research is that writers tell me it's simultaneously One of the funnest things, most fun parts of writing, and they also tell me that it's the most frustrating and difficult part of writing. And I I think both are absolutely true. And that the two-faced nature of research actually makes the research trap tricky because you can fall into the trap because it's fun and you love it, but you can also fall into it because you don't love it or you don't fully understand it. And the research trap creates a lot of aggravation It can make you miss deadlines. It can keep your work from being as good as it should be. And, you know, maybe worst of all, it can add up to weeks and months and even years of wasted time. So that's our goal today. Understanding the research trap, why people fall into it, and some strategies to avoid it. So what is the research trap? Uh, I define the research trap as the act of conducting unnecessary research uh, or Uh, conducting research in an inefficient or ineffective manner. In the King's English, you've fallen into the trap if you're using research to waste time and avoid writing, or if you're doing research without a clear plan of attack. Uh, So why why do people fall into the research trap? Well, as I said, it's it's a little tricky because you can actually fall into it for a bunch of different reasons that aren't really all that similar, right? Uh, The summary, though, is it's fun, it's low stakes, it looks productive, and it's confusing. <laughs> All right, let's, let's roll through those. All right, so it, it's fun, it's rewarding, maybe even a little addictive. Uh, I've talked to a lot of writers who just say, I could do research forever. I love to learn. And I'm sure there's a Gallup strengths there with learning and new information or, or whatever, and a lot of writers score very high on this. Because let's face it, for a lot of us, learning is fun. And learning for a new project that you're excited about is awesome. And, you know, many, I think many of us writer, creator types have a gazillion read later files and links of things in Evernote and other places to read later. You know, a lot of writers are like knowledge magpies or, you know, arcane canon lore lovers, right? And that's one of the reasons books are so awesome because they're full of crazy stuff that you know, only writers know <laughs> and they know them because they spend a lot of time reading and learning now that's great but the problem is that sometimes it can be so fun and the incentive to stay in research mode can be so strong that we don't make enough time for writing so it can be fun and addictive then that's one problem 
Um, a second problem is that research is low stakes, uh, which makes it great for avoiding anxiety producing things like writing. <laughs> um, so, you know, for example, uh, imposter syndrome makes it uh, difficult uh, sometimes for us to produce writing that other people are going to read. Um, and so, you know, imposter syndrome turns about uh, turns out to be a phenomenal motivator for wasting time doing research because uh, if you don't feel confident in your uh, your views or your words, you're going to feel like you need to spend 10 times as long doing research in order to produce something that you're willing to show people. And I've seen that over and over again with students. Um, but more generally, even experienced writers can be very concerned about what people are going to think about their next piece of work. And that also is a great recipe for research paralysis because it's, rather than, you know, get the reckoning, to delay that, you just retreat back into research where it's safe and warm and you don't have to face face judgment, right? Um, and then uh, research also looks productive, uh, even if that's an illusion. So we can tell ourselves we're doing things even when we're actually avoiding what we really need to do, you know, like the hard work. So I, I think probably everyone falls into the research trap at least occasionally to avoid hard work. Um, you know, it, sometimes it's because it just hard. Sometimes it's because it's like a little scary, like, the, you know, you got the tough chapter coming up. Or for me, it's like if I ever get to the footnotes and endnotes part of the thing, I'm like, okay, I probably need to do something, anything other than this. Oh, research, that's a good idea, right? Um, so it's easier to do research, right, than to write. It just is because you don't have to produce anything. You don't have to do the hard stuff. All you have to do is read things that other people have said, right? That's a lot easier. So avoiding the hard work uh, is often um, one of the reasons I think we retreat back into research. Um, a more serious version of this, though, is I think that, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who have notebooks, you know, physical, digital, etc., full of notes um, that they've spent, you know, years writing and they've read you know, if they were on Question Time, you know, the game show in England, they would win. Um, but they haven't written anything. And I think sometimes people fall into this research trap because they just simply are not willing to pay the costs of writing. Um, and not be the avoidance of hard work per se, right? It's not that it's hard. It's just that it's, it's time. And that time commitment just might be too great because of all sorts of reasons. Um, now, if, if, if you're stuck in research mode because you you don't want to spend the time and that's fine. You just love learning, then call it a hobby and, and we'll not call it a trap. We'll just call it the research hobby because you have a hobby to learn everything there is to know about trains or planes or automobiles. That's fine. But if you're doing that, but all the time you're unhappy because you're trying to tell yourself and other people that you're actually writing a book, but what you've only been doing is research, then you're, you're in the research trap. So probably need to figure out a way around that. And then the last reason that people fall into the research trap, and this is, I think, a lot of people, is that research is confusing. <laughs> it's amorphous. It's nebulous. <laughs> um, and, you know, just like with the book writing process, if you're not familiar with the research process, you're good, you can, it's easy to waste time because you don't know what you're doing. Um, and, you know, I, I wasted many, many moons on, on research uh, while writing my dissertation because this was the first really, really big project I've ever done. I was very ignorant about what needed to go into a book, into each chapter even, what was enough research to produce a professional, you know, result. And, you know, because of all that, I, I just kept reading until I ran out of things that were even remotely tangential to read. I, and then I wrote. And that was a mistake. And I think of the four years I spent working on my dissertation, uh, at least nine to 12 months were unnecessary reading that never produced anything in my dissertation. And that's just terrifying to me. <laughs> I wish I could have that year back. Um, or, you know, another example, I was talking recently with the writer who was really frustrated because she had, you know, she had research in her plan. So she was doing the research, you know, all good so far. But every week she would sort of tick the box. Okay, I did the research, but she didn't know if she was getting anywhere. So, in, you know, in 12 week year parlance, she didn't have reliable indicators of progress. She did the research, or she did research. Did she do the research? Mm -hmm. She didn't know. <laughs> so she ticked off the box and said, I did it, but she wasn't sure if she was getting anywhere. 
right? And so just not knowing enough about the research project uh, to structure it efficiently is another version of the research trap. So the summary is you can get into the research trap in all sorts of ways. Um, the flip of the question is how do we how do we avoid the research trap? How do we get out of the research trap? So let me say a few things about that. All right, the first way I think that you can avoid the research trap is to be proactive in managing the writing research balance. Because clearly writing is a necessary input to the writing process for almost every book. But, but by definition, the research trap is an imbalance between research and writing that's tilted too far to research, either, you know, for a long time or even just for a short time. And so thinking of ways to manage that balance can be uh, a really good strategy. And I have a bunch of uh, thoughts for you there. So the first is sort of the most basic, and that is to make sure that you actually plan out your writing and your research. And this, you know, not surprising coming from the 12-week year people. Um, now, the reason I actually start with this, even though it sounds obvious, is that actually many people believe that research, kind of like writing, is such a nebulous, unplannable process that, you know, you just you can't put it down in a reasonable plan. And I say this is false. And, you know, I say this as someone who has done research professionally. So I, I feel confident in saying, yes, you absolutely can plan your research. You can plan your writing. And this is true despite the fact that you don't always know exactly how your writing or your research is going to go. You don't always know what you're going to find or necessarily perfectly how long it's going to take. But, but just because you can't make a perfect prediction of how long a thing will take or exactly what will come out of it doesn't mean you don't make plans. That, that's, that's an illogical leap. And I, I think a lot of fiction writers, a lot of creative folks, um, kind of rebel at the notion that you can plan creativity. And, and I've always tried to be clear, I, you can't plan to have a blinding insight. But you can plan to do is to sit down from 10 to 12 and attempt to have a blinding insight, right? Um, and the same with research. You, you can't be for sure how long it will take you to find a fact, say, in a history book. But you can take a guess, put it on the schedule, and update your guess as you go. All right? So the, the first tip then is to create your 12-week plans which is mu with as much clarity as you can about how much research and how much writing you want to get done. Now, as you move through a project, that balance is going to tilt. So at the beginning of many 12-week years, you're going to be research heavy. When you're at the start of a project, that's when you usually do that research so you can feed the whole project, right? While later in the project, you're going to tilt more heavily towards writing because you're pretty much done with the research and now it's just time to get the thing written. And, you know, again, along the way, you might run into a place where you're like, oh, I didn't realize I was going to need to know I want to take my character somewhere else and I haven't done any research on that setting yet. I'll, I want to stick them on a boat. And I don't know anything about sailing. Fine, right? Then you create a new updated plan and you block out some time to learn about the sailing piece. Uh, but putting it in your plan is key. <coughs> so a second piece, very closely related, is to schedule your research with time blocks. So, you know, you need to honor your need and your desire to do research, but you need to stay in control and don't let it take over. Um, so you're going to want to schedule uh, your research with, you know, call them a research block. Maybe you have writing blocks, maybe you have research blocks. And in fact, I, I would kind of recommend that because I think those two mindsets are very different. Um, and so I think having research during one day or on one session and then breaking that up with writing at a different time is probably good um, just because I think it the transition costs from one to the other can be severe. Um but that way, you don't let research just sort of, um, you know, become the blob that eats your week. Um, you know, the worst thing you can do, I think, is to say, well, I'm going to start doing research on Monday. and We'll see how long it takes. N nope, because then you're going to be in violation of Thrall's Law, which is that research will expand to fill up the time you give it. If you do not put it in a box, it will take over your week. So schedule your research with tie blocks. Keep it in check and keep the balance between writing and research so that you're going to stay healthy. And uh, let me follow up and suggest a way to do that. And a simple way to do that is to just alternate your research and writing sessions. So, um, you know, just give yourself a simple rule. Don't allow yourself to have two research blocks in a row. If you're having trouble avoiding the research trap, just don't ever let yourself have two days of research in a row. Make, make yourself write the next day. You know, and, and this can be true if, if you're a person where this is a real issue, 
even at the start of a project, make yourself right all the time, right? So every other day or every other, or you know, morning you do research, afternoon you do writing. And just make yourself iterate and alternate so that you keep your head in the writing game and you don't get sucked down fully into the world of research. Because again, I know that can be a real challenge. Okay, another thought here <laughs> to manage the balance is to uh, use research, um, you know, if, if you're someone who has a hankering to do some aimless research <laughs> or, or buttering, right? If, you, if, you're, if you're that sort of person, and I'm that sort of person, I like to putter, uh, I like to learn random crap all the time, even if it doesn't have to do with my current project. So the way I've learned to deal with that is to, I, I don't put that kind of stuff in my plan, but what I do is I will schedule a short block at the end of the day or at the end of the week um, for, for puttering or whatnot as a, as a reward for getting my other stuff done. So if I'm having a good week, I get a block to do whatever puttery kind of stuff I want. Often it has to do with various kinds of research. And another way I use research is, um, as defense. And, um, well, if you've listened to all my podcasts, you've probably heard me talk about playing offense and defense. Uh, but when I talk about time use, one of the things I often talk about is, you, you schedule your week as if you're going to be at full strength and you schedule yourself to play offense, right? To do all the hard things, do all the good stuff. But, you know, <laughs> by the end of the day, you can have blown all your gaskets and you're not good for much. But my thought is I can keep moving forward um, if I play defense, right? I find what's the easiest thing to do uh, or the easiest, you know, the thing I can manage that still moves me forward at least a little bit in a way that makes um, some progress. Uh, on my project and you know on a really bad day it might be organize my desk or you know clean up my computer folders but um, but research can be something that is very easy at the end of the day even when you can't write anymore when your deep work brain is kind of gone it still can be easy to read something that you've been looking forward to read Ing, reading <laughs> right so using uh, research as kind of the end of the day defense sort of thing or as a reward those are another couple of ways to do it so so that first recommendation is to manage be active in managing the writing slash research balance okay the second suggestion is to fight the fear um, so the, the to the extent that you find yourself using research to dial down your anxiety the best way forward is to fight that anxiety directly right rather than just retreating into research uh, and putting off the anxiety, it's better to find strategies to cope with that anxiety and reduce it directly. And I, I've dealt with some of these issues in other podcasts, you know, talked about finishing projects, uh, imposter syndrome showing up, some of those things where, where fear and anxiety raise their heads. But just to sort of corral a few of those strategies from, from those episodes, one of the things I think helps a lot, um, dialing back fear and anxiety um, that can produce, you know, the research trap is to, is to get over your fear of failure by failing early and failing often. And that, that sounds weird and strange, but by that, I mean, um, sharing your work when it's very new and small and when you're, you know, most worried in some senses about how people are like, it's not, I'm not, this isn't very good yet. I haven't done, it's not a final dress, not polished. Yeah, sure. Share that. Share it early. Get used to getting feedback on it early. Um, and it has several upsides right first of all is you get over the fear of getting feedback on it because you start getting feedback on it and it doesn't kill you and in fact the other benefit is it makes whatever you're doing better a lot of times and it depends on what you're working on of course but like you can get great feedback from writing groups from friends from siblings parents monkeys uncles the internet um and um you know don't do it in unfriendly spaces but um feeling early and feeling often is a very good way to build your confidence over time in what you're working on. Because if you do that, you share that often enough, by the time you get done, um, you know it's really strong and you're not scared anymore. And you'll find that your need to retreat back into research has been eliminated. Another way to fight the fear is to write in community. And, you know, that can be part of the fail early and fail often strategy. But I think writing with a writing group, uh, just being able to talk about your anxieties, your concerns, um, with others who all have the same concerns about sharing their work with the world and all that stuff, 
or working on the hard pieces, right? When you can share those burdens, they, they are halved and um, it becomes much easier to, to keep moving forward. So I think that's another good strategy for fighting the fear. Uh, another piece for those of us who are perfectionists uh, who, or who worry about um, imposter syndrome and things like that, another strategy that I, I learned a um, long time ago was to relieve yourself of command. A lot of us have trouble stopping doing the research because we're just sure it's never gonna be good enough. And one of the tricks I learned uh, from a, a very famous political scientist, you know, famous to political scientists, not actually famous, um, was that uh, you need to relieve yourself of command sometimes, right? You take yourself out of the role of deciding if it's good enough, right? And let some external source be the one to tell you it's ready or not. So maybe it's an editor, maybe it's an agent, maybe it's a writing group, maybe it's a journal reviewer, a book review, whatever it might be so that you don't worry about how whether it's done and let them tell you what needs to be done and you know that's can be scary in itself but but relieving yourself of the need to decide it's done can be very good at helping you stop <laughs> uh, the research hamster wheel and then the last piece um, in terms of fighting fear is to take small steps and and this is something i talk a lot about in the writing routine workbook but um a lot of times when we're having uh, fear or anxiety about something, say writing a, a tough chapter that you're worried about or you know, starting a thesis or, or whatever it might be, and you don't want to stop the research because that would mean I have to start the scary stuff, the w one very, very good strategy is to identify the first least scary thing you can and get a little win, you know, and then start with another little win and, and start, just take small steps that aren't scary. What's the next thing that you could write or do that isn't scary uh, and work on those things. Don't think of the whole thing all at once that might scare you, right? But think of break those big projects into tiny, tiny bits so that you can do them one by one without, without being so scared of them. Right. And, and that way you can, um, you can fight the fear and not need to retreat into research. Okay. Third, third strategy and, and kind of related and that is to make your writing easier and more enjoyable um, you know as I was saying one of the reasons we sometimes like research is it's, it's just easier <laughs> it's easier to read other people's stuff it's more fun than writing uh, writing can be hard it makes you sweat uh, and so you know our brains especially in the moment like to do things that are easy compared to things that are hard all right, well, one obvious counter strategy move then is to make your writing more fun and enjoyable. Make it make it easier, right? Or at least a little less difficult, right? And there are so many ways we can do this. I think a lot of times when we find ourselves stuck in the research trap and we say, oh, I don't want to write, um, we're just sitting around waiting for the writing to feel less difficult. But that's that's not a very good strategy, right? So let's be proactive about making writing easier. And that's, again, that's the whole point of my my routine workbook. But, you know, what about co-authoring? You know, are you having, are you struggling with something that you could co-author? Get someone else to help with? Great. How about brainstorming? Instead of trying to um, to write the whole thing, just work on brainstorming, right? Or how about using uh, AI to get something, something, anything on the page to work with, an outline, a first crappy draft, something, right? Or you know, as my workbook suggests, create a more humane writing routine. Maybe maybe your writing is feeling difficult because you're doing it at a weird time of day, or you're not giving yourself enough coffee and chocolate or you're, you're writing in the basement instead of a pretty coffee shop or whatever it is. Uh, or maybe you need some writing dates or a writing group to make it more fun and motivating, right? Maybe you need to hop online and do a writing sprint with other like-minded people. Or maybe you need a writing retreat to go, you know, go somewhere pretty and quiet to get the hard part done. Um, or maybe you need to start rewarding yourself uh, for hitting your writing goals for the day. Right, because what's not going to work is just sitting around and hoping that it's going to feel easy tomorrow if it isn't feeling easy today. Now, it randomly might happen that way, but I'm guessing it's probably not going to. So, being proactive, finding ways, strategizing ways to make your writing easier and more enjoyable is uh, is a very big strategy. And last but not least, um, is the Strategy number four, and that is never do research without a clear research question. Uh, many of the people who get stuck in the research trap are there because they just don't know 
how to structure the research process. And that's fair. You know, graduate students take courses in research methods and practice doing research in pretty much every course they take. And it can still be difficult um, because, you know, research is a, is a general strategy of inquiry, not a simple recipe that you can follow and then you're done, you know. Um, but if I could sum up the basic problem in a single sentence, I would say, I would say this. If you don't know what you're looking for, you will find everything and nothing. And that sentence, that gem of a sentence, comes from one of my good buddies in graduate school who was um, started his dissertation about six months before I did. And as I started into my dissertation, he told me, you know, I'm going to give you one piece of advice I've already learned, and that is um, make sure you know what you're looking for when you start your literature review because otherwise you're going to find everything and nothing. Right? And boy, was he correct because I found a lot of everything and a lot of nothing as I just mentioned so I tried to follow his advice um, even so that was difficult but right to, to avoid getting lost in the research you should never launch into a research session don't read a book don't read an article if you don't have a clear narrowly focused and answerable research question in your head on a piece of paper that you are trying to answer when you pick that thing up to read or else you will find everything and you'll find nothing. All right, just, just as an example, let, let's say you're gonna write a murder mystery set on a farm in rural England in 1805. But before you run to the library to start reading random histories of the, you know, England in 1805, let's get a little more specific, right? Establish your plot, create your characters, determine your scenes, your settings, outline the book, Right now, now you're in a much better place to figure out the things you really need to know, right? I mean, there's no need to read a lot about the like naval battles with England and France if your book takes place on a farm right in the north of England, far away from the action. Now, if if you feel you know relatively comfortable with your general knowledge of the area, I, I would recommend just going ahead and writing, and then wherever you run into some kind of specific knowledge gap where you're like, ah, I would be more comfortable if I knew more about harvest day or whatever put that section in brackets or italics or highlight them or make sure a footnote or whatever follow that up for later but don't slow down just because you don't know one or two things right now on the other hand if you're a complete you know newbie to the era or whatever and you feel like you need to do a significant amount of research to just even write a reasonable first draft then i recommend you generate a series of specific research questions for each of the sort of the topics and characters and, and settings that you need to know more about. Now, what you don't want to do is just run to the library and check out every book on England around 1805. Because again, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for when you pick up one of those books, you're going to find everything and nothing. And, and I, I can actually see exactly how this is going to go. You're going to pick up this book and you're going to have a, a notepad and on every page you're going to start writing down things that are interesting. <laughs> everything's going to look interesting because you have no idea if it's going to go in your book or not. But of course it won't. There, you can't read five books of English history and all that stuff's going to go in your book, which is going to be shorter than all of those books anyway, right? Of course. And your book's not about history. It's a murder mystery. So, you know, none of that stuff is going to make it into your book. Hmm. So why are you reading it all, right? Uh, and the problem is you're going to take notes on all this stuff that isn't going to go on the book. And in the midst of that, just that, so, you know, flurry of stuff that isn't going to go in your book, you're not going to be able to see the stuff that actually could be useful, right? You're going to miss it because there's just going to be too much noise. So the key is to have a clear, narrow, and answerable research question in your mind before you dive in. And that's what you're going, that's your project. That's what research is. Research is not reading. It's answering questions. So here's a bad research question. What was England like in 1805? <laughs> that's, that's now i that's that's a terrible question right because it's, t it's too vague it's too broad it's completely open-ended you can't answer it you're literally never finished answering that question you could get a phd in english history and not nearly be done answering that question and yet i know many writers who basically think about research that way well i guess i have to learn a lot about x no, nope, no, you don't. That's a terrible, that's a, that's a recipe for wasting time right there, right? Now, I don't mind if you want to read a few general histories or books on, you know, key topics of, around the era to get a vibe or get in the mood, 
right? Or to look out for any sort of juicy bits or something that really just like jump off the page. I have to include that. Like that's such a funny story. But please limit how much of that you do, right? See Thrall's Law. You could do that and get a PhD. You don't want to do that, right? Your book does not need nearly as much of that detail as you probably think it does before you start. And you can waste an infinite amount of time on that stuff, right? And unless your goal is actually to produce something that reads like a history of 1805 England, right? You really don't need to go that deep. So what would a good research question look like? Well, here are a few thoughts. What did an English farmer do on a typical planting day? What crops did English farmers grow in that part of England? What did women do on farms? What did a Christmas holiday celebration look like on the farm? Right? Now, if you're a novelist and you're thinking, I'm writing a murder mystery set in England, like you can start to see why these questions might be useful. Right? Maybe my main character is a farmer. Maybe his wife or his daughter is involved and you know I need to know what they're going to be doing on now, maybe the murder takes place during Christmas, so I need to know what a Christmas holiday celebration might have looked like so I could set the action, right? Maybe I need to ask a question about law enforcement, right? Who was in charge of investigating murder in 1805 in England on a rural farm, right? Those are good questions because they're clear, they're narrowly focused, and that makes them easy to answer. Now, notice, not necessarily easy to find the answer it might be hiding in a huge book or it might be a sort of a, a factoid that you know doesn't show up very often it's not a very commonly discussed thing so you might be hard pressed to find the answer but the point is once you find the information the question's immediately answered right as soon as you find a section that says christmas on the farm you're done right it's not like you have to figure that out okay and the more you can structure your research into these kinds of questions, the easier you're going to find doing the research and the less likely you're going to get stuck down the rabbit hole or with, you know, vague plans that are hard to track, right? Because when you have this research question, that concise, clear, narrow research question approach, it's going to be much easier to create plans, right, that involve research and to track your progress. Because... You'll scope out your 12-week plan and you'll figure out, okay, during this 12-week plan, which research questions do I need to answer? Because these are the things I've already decided that I need to answer to, to write my book. You plot those out on your weekly plans and you tick them off. And the thing you're going to know is that once you've answered that question, you have taken a positive, concrete step towards getting your work done. Voila. So that's, in a nutshell, how, how, you, how you do that. Okay. Um, that's a lot for one for one episode, action-packed. I, I hope you don't have nightmares about the research trap after listening to this episode. Instead, I hope you are energized and feel confident in your ability to tackle research and, um, and have some ways to avoid the research trap in the future. Uh, until next time, happy writing. <laughs>